All right. So hello, this is Amani Abdelsalam here from Schools That Can Newark. We're so excited that you're here joining us for this session, The Social Side of Opportunity, Expanding Students' Social Capital to Expand Their Options. We are so excited to hear from, from our speaker and even more excited to hear from you. We do hope that you'll interact and participate in the chat as much as possible to post questions and any comments you may have throughout the day. We also encourage you to post a simple plus one if you agree with a particular comment or a question would like clarity on a particular question. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session, Julia Freeland Fisher, the Director of Education Research at the Clayton Christensen Institute. Julia is a thought leader in the field of student social capital. She talks about the often overlooked importance of social networking to help students get ahead with a particular interest in students from low income communities who need social capital the most. In our current age of social distancing, how can students bridge the social capital gap that plays an important role in the education to employment pathway? We thought this makes for a powerful session. Julia will be delivering a TED Talk style presentation with plenty of time to ask interactive questions. You're in for a treat learning more about this important topic. Thank you, Julia, for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amani, and thanks everyone for joining. I have a big disclaimer before we get started, which is that I have a five month old, two badly behaved dogs, and a very. So, any noises in the background, that is my life unfolding um, before your eyes and ears. But I'm super excited uh, to be talking to you guys today about the topic of who students know. Uh, like Amani said, this is a topic of my research at a place called the Clayton Christensen Institute, or a small nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank that studies innovation in the public sector. And we're actually best known for our work in online and blended learning. But when I joined the Christensen Institute about seven years ago, I felt like we weren't talking about the whole of the opportunity equation. And particularly, we were looking a lot at where technology could expand what students knew, um, could expand productivity, could maybe introduce new forms of assessment. But we were totally ignoring the way that many of us have gotten our own jobs, which is who you know. So today I'm gonna walk through that research. I'm gonna give some COVID-19 specific commentary towards the end of I think where schools and school systems need to be thinking ahead around the relationship infrastructure we have in place. But I'm also gonna be talking more broadly about what sociology research tells us about the importance of networks to help us both get by and get ahead. So um, without further ado, I start every talk with sort of an existential question, which is how did you get here? That seems like a funny question right now, since here for most of you is some corner of a living room or a basement or a home office or a studio. Um, but what I mean by this question is how did you get to the current professional role that you're playing in your life um, that gave you the latitude and the great opportunity to learn through a conference like this and who helped you? And we all have stories like this. We all have stories maybe of early mentors that helped us get where we are today. And maybe the person who just, you reached out to a friend of a friend who got you um, the job that you're in today. And my own story for how I got here presenting today is really about a chain reaction of networks. I had uh, profiled a school out in California called Da Vinci. Um, that does awesome project based in real world learning for those of you who don't know them. Um, and one of their founders mentioned to one of the founders of schools that can that I was doing this work and he invited me to present today. So just like I'm going to be talking about, I'm here today because of a network. Um, this is a simplistic mental model sort of, of, of how we think about students and, 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 what's important for them. Uh, but on the left side, we have what students know. This is what economists would think of as your human capital, what the labor market will pay you to do. And given the sort of account accountability climate in schools for the past two decades, we've spent a lot of time paying attention to what students do and don't know. And I'd argue that we've done that to the detriment, um, or it's created a blind spot in terms of whom our students know. And the reason why I think we should be concerned about that is that really um, opportunity sits at the cross section of these two, of what we know and of whom we know. One of the startling statistics 
that undergirds our research is that an estimated half of jobs come through personal connections. And if you look at some of the more emergent research at data such as LinkedIn data, uh, which skews towards jobs in the knowledge economy, that number can go upwards of 80%. So we can hammer away at things like the achievement gap, which we absolutely need to continue to do, but we're still not actually tackling the whole of access to opportunity if we ignore students' access to networks that might help them get jobs. Um, lest that sound like I think that the purpose of uh, education is just to get a job though, it's worth pointing out that the benefits of relationships and social capital actually appear in education research from, from the very start and particularly to the theme of this conference, who you know shaping your career aspirations and trajectory starts in fact as early as elementary school. I sometimes refer to this as my think tank asshole slide because it has about 4,000 words on it that I don't expect all of you to read. If any of you want a copy of the slide deck after, I'm happy to share it. But the gist of this is that um, as early as our elementary grades, exposure to people working in certain professions actually shapes what we view to be possible for our future selves. So some of you may have heard of the Lost Einstein study um, out of Raj Chetty's shop that came out two years ago. What they found uh, studying who was um, participating in the innovation economy was that young people who were exposed to adults working in careers related to that innovation economy were far more likely, regardless of aptitude, to actually end up in that economy. Um, and, and this has real equity considerations for those of us who care about both individuals and the health of our nation. What they found was that young people from low income backgrounds but high math aptitude were actually 10 times less likely than their affluent peers of sort of mediocre math aptitude to enter the innovation economy. What that tells us, right, which we already probably know if you're part of this conference, is that there's a big myth around meritocracy that we're not tackling if we, again, focus only on core academics and don't think about exposure to networks. If you move your way up this pipeline, webs of support and developmental relationships have a lot to do with whether students stay in school and succeed in school. Access to near peer mentors predicts college access and success. And then down the line, access to diverse networks into the knowledge economy, predict graduates, prospects in the labor market. And I'd argue that most of you, if you're working in schools, you already know that relationships matter, but our system has sort of relegated relationships to inputs instead of outcomes. So if you keep sort of shoving relationships at the problems we're trying to solve in the immediate, we will routinely underinvest in what we think of as a student's reservoir of social capital that he or she can continue to tap into long beyond a particular intervention or even experience in school and into his or her life. So what is social capital? This is a bit of a loaded term. And if I were going to take you down a real research rabbit hole, I would tell you all 25 definitions that are circulating in the academy right now. But the basic premise is that social networks have value, that they contain resources. Um, and like our, the resources in our wallets or the resources that we bring to bear when we go to work to get paid to do what we do, um, that value is real and can be realized at different points in our life. Robert Putnam is one of the more famous scholars in this space. He talks about connections among individuals and, and sort of levels of trustworthiness. And he thinks about this a lot at the level of the community. What I'd urge you to do um, if you're working in schools is to not just sort of sit with that community level concept, but to think about other research that thinks about this at the level of the individual. So I suspect that many of you work with students who have very different networks that they go home to, different networks that they may have inherited. And if we wanna think about equitable access to networks, we actually have to drill down to that individual level. So we follow research from a, a professor named Nan Lin out of Duke University, who's done a lot of thinking about that individual level of social capital. Um, and because again, I'm a think tank asshole, I had to come up with my own definition for y'all. Um, but this is a definition that we've been circulating for about two years. And I just wanna underline one point of this, which is that sometimes once we become adults, our sort of stock of social capital can be a little more steady state depending on the profession we chose and what we're trying to get done in our lives, and that's okay. But for young people, 
they are still exploring um, what they may want to become. They are exploring jobs that are only now starting to emerge as relevant options for them. And so rather than thinking of social capital as a static asset, I think it's really important to think of it as something that shifts and emerges in a responsive way as students' interests shift over time. Lastly, just to break this down a little more concretely, when we say networks have value, what do we think that actually means? Um, I think that it's important to flag that different value can sort of arrive at different moments. And this is all academic language for stuff that you guys who are working directly with students are probably dealing in every day. But sometimes our networks just give us information, right? Particularly when you think about that job statistic, a lot of jobs are never even listed, right? They're never even publicly listed. You find out about them through word of mouth, and that's how information really can give you a competitive advantage. Um, but the benefits of connections go further than just information. It's about influence. It's about the ability for someone to refer you or vouch for you. And it's also about social credentials and the sort of idea that someone is credentialing you by saying you can come and be part of this particular job or this particular community. And lastly, I think particularly important um, right now uh, amidst sort of this crisis is this concept of personal reinforcement, that you belong, that you belong as a part of a given community because you are part of that network. And that really has true value for students. Now, across those four dimensions, it can be important to think about the different value delivering. But there's also sort of different types of relationships that I want to take a second to talk about. And this is a, a simplistic mental model, but I think particularly important for those of you who are trying to get young people out into the real world, perhaps learning through work-based learning, perhaps networking or doing job, job shadows, perhaps just um, spending time in their community doing projects. And that's the distinction between strong ties and weak ties. So this is a distinction in sociology. Um, and strong ties tend to refer to those connections that are closest to us, that provide us with the greatest sources of care. They tend to be the most likely to lend us actual resources like their time or their money. Um, strong ties are incredibly important. They're incredibly important to buffer against risk. They're huge predictors of well being. Um, they're also very high bandwidth. Um, and by that, I mean my loud husband, who I mentioned, he provides me a lot of care. He shares his resources with me. He also takes up a ton of my bandwidth, right? Takes a lot of bandwidth to be married to him. No offense to him. And um, because of that, we actually can only maintain so many strong ties in our lives. We can only invest so much in this sort of core network of folks. But we also know that we don't just know those strong ties. We also have a bunch of weak ties. These are our acquaintances, the people with whom we spend less time, right? And if you recall my story of how I ended up on this virtual stage today, that was a chain of weak tie connections that got me here, which is actually quite consistent with what the research shows, which is that as much as our weak ties may not be the first people to lend us care or money, um, they are actually more likely to have new information and opportunities than our strong tie networks. And this has led to some sociologists coining the term the strength of weak ties, which describes the fact that, in fact, you are more likely to find a job, a new job opportunity through your weak tie network than your strong tie network, because our strong ties tend to contain redundant information, whereas our weak ties offer new information. The reason why I think this is really important is that in education systems, very understandably, if you're a student of youth development literature, we tend to often sort of think the stronger the relationship, the better, right? The more that teachers can form strong relationships with students, the more that we can have durable mentoring relationships for our young people in their lives, the better. And as much as that is critical, I think we don't want to short shrift the fact that we also should be at the same time cultivating diverse weak tie networks for students in order to expand their horizons and access points to opportunity. The last thing I want to say here, just to sort of responsibly represent the whole of the research out there, is that this really is a simplistic mental model. And there's some emerging research that I think is interesting for those of us thinking about education systems coming from a researcher named Mario Luis Small at Harvard University. And Mario Luis Small's most recent book is called Someone to Talk to, and he studied graduate students. Um, to understand sort of their first year in graduate school, who were they confiding in? And conventional sociological research would say, well, you confide in your strong ties, right? Those are your confidants. Those are the people that you lean on. 
But Mara Louise Small found that in fact, as, as graduate students were sort of undergoing the pressures of this new experience of being in graduate school, the demands placed on them, maybe they had moved to go to school, rather than confiding in their strong ties, these young people were actually turning to almost strangers. They were like confiding in their Uber drivers. <laughs> Um, and his takeaway was that in some ways we sort of tend to lean on people more spontaneously than you might expect based on traditional sociology research. But also, and I think this is the really important point as we think about young people wending their way through the world, sometimes you actually want to turn to someone who is lower stakes than the people in your strong tie network. Sometimes you don't want to disappoint someone in your strong tie network by telling them you're struggling. Sometimes you don't want to um, sort of turn to someone who may have bet on you or lent you money or care and make them feel disappointed in you. So again, this value of, of weaker ties, the names sort of the namesake sounds negative, but I think we really should keep in mind as we think about creating networks of support and opportunity for young people. Um, this may go without saying, but there's slim but troubling data that this is actually a, an underexplored gap in students' lives. Um, and that students don't actually have equal access to networks. A couple statistics that undergird this. The first is that we all inherit a network um, and our parents' professional networks obviously will vary depending on what they do. And so if you look at this data, this is from um, Robert Putnam, who I mentioned before, but looking at Pew data, um, parents with a high school diploma or less are half as likely to know professors, CEOs, Congress people. If you want to know a congressperson in 2020, I don't know who you are, but, um, and, and the like. And so this is to say, not that this is a, a sort of testament to how caring those parents are, but simply what they can provide to their offspring in terms of professional networks differs by education level. Another gap that many of us are probably already aware of is gaps in enrichment spending. So what this graph shows is that affluent parents have really run amok when it comes to enrichment spending, um, whereas parents from the bottom income quintile have actually remained fairly steady. Um, now, this could be distressing from an experiential learning standpoint, exposure standpoint, but we actually think of it as a proxy for what students report as unequal access to quote unquote informal mentors. And an informal mentor is really anyone who a young person turns to in his or her life, not through maybe a formal big brothers or big sisters mentoring program, but through the naturally occurring adults in the course of their days and weeks and school years. And as you can see here, whereas access to sort of family supports is actually quite on par, access to quote unquote non-family adults is quite uneven. And again, if we go back to that 50% of jobs coming through uh, personal networks, this data should be troubling to any of us worried about addressing opportunity gaps. So the good news though, is that innovations really are on the horizon um, and these are the three kind of buckets of innovations that we've been studying over the past three or four years. Um, and I'm gonna do a little bit on each and then I hope when we open up for conversation, maybe you guys can share what you're doing within these buckets as well. The first is integrated student supports. We'll talk about what it means to have a true sort of co coherent web of support around a young person and what some of the successful models we're seeing are that do that. Um, that again, in amidst COVID-19 feels incredibly crucial and like something that many schools have maybe underinvested in historically. The second is where education technology has a play here um, and where ed tech can actually start to diversify connections beyond the geog geographic constraints of students' networks. And lastly, where I think many of you who are sort of part of the schools that can community probably fall um, is instructional model redesign. So how are we actually rethinking teaching and learning to make it a more inherently networked experience where students come out not just with skills and knowledge but also with a network. So this first bucket of integrated student supports, if folks haven't heard this term, um, this is sort of wraparound services 2.0. This is a term of art coming out of the research community looking at what sorts of wraparound services models have been most effective. And one of the things that people have discovered, and our own research sort of confirms this, is that the key to wraparound services is not just making sure that all of those non-academic gaps that poverty may erect in young people's lives are getting addressed, so access to healthcare, access to mental health support, 
access to after school programming. Um, all of those access points are critical, but the most successful models have managed to keep teachers in that wraparound services loop meaning that teachers actually understand the circumstances that their students may be confronting beyond the classroom and are adjusting their instruction within the classroom accordingly. So I think that this, again, right now, it's it's a, a, both an important time to be having this conversation, but also an overwhelming one. But as you're thinking about school systems right now under the pressure to triage some of these support services to sort of stand up meal delivery programs, make sure families have connectivity at home, think about whether mom and dad or grandma and grandpa can actually help support student learning at home. This concept of an integrated web of support becomes even more powerful. Um, and research has actually shown that rather than sort of a one caring adult, which has been part of the youth development conversation for decades, rather than just young people needing one caring adult, the, the best support systems are an interconnected web of caring adults. And so that really echoes our findings here. We have one example here, City Connect. This is a program built out of Boston College. Um, they work with K-12 schools to embed um, sort of student support coordinators who help to coordinate with outside agencies and really have found that part of their success hinges on the ability of that coordinator to actually know each student and each family to communicate with teachers who then know each student and each family better. So this is really a relationship-driven intervention, not just sort of helping families access resources. The other model I have up here, um, I know most of you are in K-12 systems, but this is a post-secondary model, co-op out of New York City in the Bay Area. And I just call them out because what co-op is doing is they're combating um, underemployment among low-income first-gen college graduates who have gone and done everything we've told them to do, secured a degree, and still haven't broken into high wage jobs um, in those two geographies, New York and the Bay Area. And co-op, um, on paper, they do some training and some job sort of training to get students and graduates ready for data analytics and technology jobs. But really, the core of their model is combating the isolation of being underemployed. And so they bring young people together, uh, historically face-to-face, -face. now it's happening virtually, in a very strong, tight-knit cohort model to ensure that each of their learners actually has a community around him um, to really combat that initial isolation and then to make their way into the job market. So that's examples of student support structures that I think go an extra mile beyond traditional wraparound services or sort of intervention models. The second piece of where technology fits, um, so I just, full disclosure, I started studying this like five years ago when uh, this did not feel particularly relevant to anyone. I wanted to understand what were the technology tools that were creating new relationships in students' lives. All of a sudden, this feels like a very um, <laughs> cliche talking point. So just full disclosure, um, I've, I've been thinking about this long before COVID-19, and I think some of these technology tools were not built for the urgency of this situation. So I just want to give that disclaimer. But when we looked at the technology market, we, we noticed a couple of things. Um, so I want to sort of break this slide down. Sorry, it's so busy. The first thing we noticed is that there's a lot of digital tools and enterprise digital tools out there like Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram that allow students to quote unquote network. But the, but the majority of those tools were not actually built to expand students' networks to help them achieve their goals. They're really glorified digital Rolodexes. Now that's not a bad thing, right? Because a really good digital Rolodex actually ensures that relationships don't decay as quickly. And decay is the sociological term for essentially falling out of touch with someone. So if you think about, I assume plenty of people on here, I know young people aren't using Facebook anymore, but those of us who are 30 and above who may have Facebook accounts, if you think about your Facebook account, you are still in touch with people you absolutely should no longer be in touch with. But that's because you have this um, sort of new digital Rolodex that gives you the power to remain connected for much longer than we may have previously with folks that we otherwise would have fallen out of touch with. Now that's an important functionality, but it's not actually going to solve for network gaps if we don't think critically about how students get connected to new people they otherwise might not meet. 
And so what we've really found to be the power of this pocket of the education technology market, and I'll share a link at the end with a market map of all the tools that we've been tracking, is that education technology tools designed to put new relationships within reach for young people are actually a really powerful way to start to diversify their weak tie networks. So let me give a couple examples here. The icon on the left, Nepris, is a two-sided marketplace platform that allows teachers to port industry experts into their classroom. And that means that students can meet someone who works in, in a variety of industries that may be not represented in their that maybe there aren't a ton of neurosurgeons in the rural town where they where they live, but actually allows them to connect to someone they might not otherwise meet. Dream Wakers is a similar value proposition. They bring outside experts into classrooms as well, but they've really focused on the sort of, um, as the saying goes, you can't be it if you can't see it. Making sure that students can actually see people working in a variety of professions who look like them. And so Dream Wakers has worked really hard to recruit uh, minority and low income professionals to work with classrooms um, that look like them, that resemble them, and help tell their stories and inspire students um, to sort of expand their horizons. That's one set of sort of exposure, industry exposure tools. There's also a number of tools stepping in to supplement where our guidance counselor to student ratios continue to fall horribly short, right? Um, students, some, some estimates put it at students in high school getting. 30 to 40 minutes a year with their guidance counselor, which we know is simply not enough to navigate not only the Byzantine college application process, but all of the choices that young people are making about their future um, during high school. And so a couple of organizations, I'll give one example here, Student Success Agency, are stepping in to provide virtual mentors and particularly near peer mentors who are themselves college students to supplement that need for advice and guidance for young people. Um, and by logging on to Student Success Agency, a high schooler will get access to what they call an agent, sort of like a sports agent, who can stick with that high schooler for years um, and who's also able to multiply the, the sheer minutes of advice that young people are getting. So whereas you're looking at average of 40 minutes per month in some comprehensive high schools, Student Success Agency, is, sorry, 40, 40 minutes a year in some comprehensive high schools, Student Success Agency is getting that monthly. And then lastly, what I have here is this concept on the right of platforms that are unlocking local supply and demand. Um, and so many of you, I hope, based on what schools that can uh, focuses on, are thinking about how young people can learn um, and engage in the business community where they live. Um, but that actually can take a bunch of coordination. It can be an enormous logistical lift that schools were not designed nor budgeted to deal with. And so a variety of tools are stepping in to solve for that. Community share is sort of like a Craigslist for teachers where teachers can go on and find guest speakers and people that they can bring into their classrooms um, or have students collaborate with in their community. And Inblaze, many of you I suspect have heard of, is a platform designed by Big Picture Learning to really manage all of the logistics associated with internship and work-based learning. So there's just a couple examples of where technology has a play. And we'll come back around to technology at the end, given that obviously we're living in a new reality um, around that. And lastly, I wanna sort of look at the innovations that we're seeing in real world and project-based learning. Um, and I'll credit, again, I mentioned big picture learning. I'll credit Elliot Washer, one of the founders of big picture with um, this sort of, little haiku that I don't think it's technically a haiku, but this saying that he really pushed me on when I was doing my research into the importance of networks, um, which is that it can be very easy to sort of understand what you know matters. It can be really easy to understand who you know matters, but part of the power of real world project-based work-based learning models is that you're actually expanding who knows what you know you're actually ensuring that more people beyond the classroom are bearing witness to young people's assets and strengths and competencies and, and can sort of informally credential those, um, whether they're a mentor at an internship site um, or giving feedback on a real world project. And so when we look at these instructional model designs, you know, many of these are not brand new. 
Um, but looking at them specifically for the sorts of networks that they create for young people is a kind of new lens on um, what has been, in some cases, decades of um, pedagogical innovation. Uh, I think that one of the important things I'll say for those of you on the call who are, who are um, thinking about these experiences, I mentioned Da Vinci. Um, da Vinci extension, which is their fifth year high school model, actually came up against, I think, what's a frequent constraint on internship and work-based learning, which is that it can be really hard to scale and really hard to scale with quality. And so what Da Vinci Exchange, they go by or extension, they go by DVX, excuse me, um, realized is they said, let's actually think about the minimum viable product, the, the MVP of an internship. So if we can't do the full stack internship, what do we definitely want students to get? And what they realized is they wanted students to get real world feedback. They wanted students to do authentic projects and they wanted students to diversify their, their networks into industry locally out there in LA. Um, and with that in mind, they designed what are called project consults, which are much shorter than a traditional internship and in fact take place primarily at the school site rather than the work site but include frequent check-ins um, with employers. And I, I mention this mostly because I think amidst COVID-19, um, employers are understandably gun shy around hosting certain internship structures or virtual learning structures. And I think schools are trying to reimagine um, what's actually feasible to do over Zoom without um, sort of major Zoom exhaustion for everyone involved. And thinking about those smaller dosage experiences like project consults, but that still give you a network on the other end of the experience, I think is a really powerful uh, thing to keep in mind. Happy to answer more questions on that when we get to discussion. So I just wanna wrap up with what this means in the current context. I'm sorry to sort of throw all that research at you and then be like, and now COVID-19, but, um, Here's what we've been thinking about over the past uh, two and a half months or so uh, in terms of opportunities to actually really take this research and apply it to the current context. Um, the first is that uh, for those of you working in schools, it, we, we would be um, unwise to assume that students don't have all sorts of social assets already, right? That research I showed you, those graphs, they're alarming, but those are sort of national samples and they don't tell us what's happening in the lives of your actual students. And so we're talking a lot about the power of relationship mapping and mapping students' networks at the level of individual students to understand who in your school building has strong relationships with those students. And also who do students have strong relationships with beyond the school building? And I'd suggest making Caring Common, which is a center out of Harvard University, has a really great relationship mapping tool um, that actually they've created a virtual protocol around that you could you could use in your school building, particularly going into next year to think about how do we know who our students know to begin with and make sure that we're continuously growing that as we go. The second piece I would say um, that sort of harkens back to that research I was talking about around strong ties and webs of support is that it can be very tempting to sort of, especially in this crisis, throw relationship resources at students to try and make sure they feel connected. But the most coherent and sort of evidence-based approach to that would take this web-based approach, would say it's important not just that students have a web of supports, but that that web itself is interconnected. So how do the adults trying to support a young person right now actually know one another and communicate with one another? Third, some of those technology tools I named, um, and there's others too, we can talk more about this, is to really harness some of the online tools that predated COVID-19, but that put new relationships within reach for young people, particularly as teachers and counselors are struggling to support all of their students. This is a moment where some of the online mentoring tools that are out there could really be a boon to making sure that your that your young people feel supported and connected and are continuing to expand their horizons even amid social distancing. Fourth, um, I know that Schools That Can's conference was originally going to be in New York City, and New York City is one of a couple of geographies that has outright canceled summer youth employment. Um, that has huge implications for accessing income for young people, but also summer tends to be a time when young people can actually diversify their networks beyond their school building, beyond their home. 
And so I think looking at ways to preserve those opportunities despite social distancing is, is really critical. And I've listed a couple of resources here. If we want to talk about that further, we can do so. Um, and lastly, I think going into school year 2020, um, we're hearing a fair amount about school districts that are going to build an infrastructure for contact tracing. Um, I hear that and I think let's build an infrastructure for support at the same time. Um, so thinking about what are the tools that your schools or school districts are thinking about using to make sure that students are safe. Um, could those CRM tools or other technology tools actually double to make sure students also have access to networks of support? Um, I am not a traveling book saleswoman. If you want to read my book, I'm happy to just send it to you. <laughs> but mostly this slide is here to tell you about um, a, a market map of relationship tools that we've been building over the past few years where you can see those technology tools I mentioned and others, and you can sort of filter by your needs. And lastly, um, here's my email address. Uh, if you wanted to be in touch after this, I would love to hear about what you're doing and also share more about our research. Um, and I just think this Wendell Berry quote is so fitting for the time that we find ourselves in. So that's my spiel. Um, and I have not been monitoring the chat because I've been talking at you guys, uh, but I would love to answer any questions um, or engage in conversation. So I think if there's if there's questions in the chat, um, I will go to some of them right now. So I'm gonna go to one, how do we execute internship apprenticeship programs in the midst of pandemic times with all the many limitations and accessibility? So I think that's a really important question. Um, let me touch on a couple models that we're seeing that I had put up on that um, slide. And actually I'm just gonna pull it back up so I can go through this list. Um, a couple resources to be aware of. Parker Dewey is a virtual internship platform that actually started off in post-secondary, um, helping college students find gig work on the platform. They are actually being asked to support some high school models. So if you're looking for a straight up virtual internship provider, that's one to look at. Um, another tool to be aware of uh, is, a, is a tool called Talent Accelerator. This is a new platform being built. They're actually demoing their platform at 4 p.m. If anyone's interested, I can share a link to their demo. It's built by a gentleman named Dan Horgan, who's been in the youth development um, and workforce space for a long time and really understands employers. And he's building a platform that will allow employers to continue to host interns um, but that takes some of the burden off of employers to do all of the sort of project design and supervision for those interns by creating ready-made projects. Um, so Talent Accelerator, I would check out. And again, Daniel Horgan is the founder of that. And then I think paying attention to, um, again, that concept of a minimum viable product and the idea that you could actually do some of the aspects of internship-based learning on a smaller scale rather than do nothing at all. So Nepris, that platform I mentioned, has built out a job shadow functionality in partnership with K-12 Inc., who's one of their lead investors. Um, and, uh, and Career Village, which is a sort of Q&A platform, sort of like Quora, if anyone has used that, Career Village allows students to go on and ask a variety of questions to a community of over 50,000 professionals who sort of answer those questions and get in dialogue with students. So there's, again, smaller dosage ways to do some of what work-based learning, I think, was trying to accomplish um, and still from afar. Okay, let's see if there's other questions. Um, raise questions to the audience as well and have them, okay. So I think um, I, I would love to hear if others are solving for this internship question um, in their schools and you could share in the chat. How much success have you seen from secondary school educators partnering with local teaching colleges? I think this is a great question. I think it's an underutilized resource of potential tutors and supports for young people. Um, it's I really think this is happening locally. It's not something we've studied sort of at the national scale. One that I would point to, though, that I think is really starting to get it right. Um, ASU has a project run by a guy named Brent Madden, um, 
who was previously at Relay Graduate School of Education. And this ASU project is called the Educator Work, the Innovative Educator Workforce Project, I believe. Um, and really what they're doing is looking at how to support through their teachers college at ASU, uh, a team teaching and community teacher model, meaning you have actually community members who are helping you have teaching candidates who are helping and you have teams of teachers and schools who are helping all to surround students with resources. Um, so that's one model I would look at. Specifically, I'm thinking of joint projects between high school and college students. Love that idea if others are, are doing more um, on that front. And I'm seeing interest in the talent accelerator thing. So I will pull that up as we talk uh, to try and share the link to that webinar. Um, how are you solving for the question of internships in your school environments? Yep, shift to remote learning. I would love folks to share on that front. I'm just catching up with the chat, y'all. So keep chatting. A lot of leverage in the strong Thai weak Thai space in reference to issues in communities that are close to them. Sorry, guys, I'm just reading questions. If there's any other questions, please chime in. Um, I would be curious to hear from you guys also. Um, again, let's keep this relevant to, to sort of COVID-19 circumstances. Um, I'm curious whether you are finding um, that there's there, your schools are able to leverage volunteer will. Um, one thing that we're hearing a lot is that people want to volunteer virtually. Um, and it's it's a mixed blessing because our schools weren't necessarily designed to pull in those volunteers in a safe and secure way. Um, one resource that I hadn't listed on this slide, but that I'd point you to is I could be.org. I could be as a virtual mentoring platform that actually recently opened up its platform. Um, to a variety of face-to-face uh, -face mentoring programs to put all of their operations online. But I would suggest to you that if you're trying to figure out sort of, oh, we have a group of volunteers, we wanna connect them to students, we wanna make sure to ha that that happens in a safe and secure way, I could be as one platform that has really prioritized safety and security um, responsibly. Depends on if the opportunity is an essential field. Some are not able to continue and some parents don't want their children being put at risk. So again, I, we hear that risk a lot. Um, I could be, is we actually feature them in our book um, before everything that's happening right now was happening and they have really been ahead of the curve. Um, I could be.org, I'm putting it into the chat for y'all. Um, and I think I, I'll, I'll call something out. Uh, can you point to any written examples of employers that have engaged in micro internships and how they coach and support to work with? It's a great question. Um, I think that that um, that some of the resources out there on this, uh, I would point you to this way ahead, uh, which unfortunately is not operating this summer, but or this school year. But this is a program out of Gap Inc. Um, that has thought a lot about how to create a web of support around young people in their first job or internship. And what's really powerful about their model is that they took youth development research and applied it to internship experiences, which is rarely do those two worlds collide. Uh, and what they did was created a big SIB model where um, students had access to a near peer young employee at GAP in addition to a supervisor model, in addition to a, a mentor from a local nonprofit. And by creating, again, it's that same web of support by drawing on multiple resources, both at the employer site, the school site, um, and younger employees, you actually end up giving students a really powerful support network. Um, and I'll say the other thing on sort of micro internships, I, I, um, I've written a piece about them that I can insert the link to. Sorry, I'm like doing 14 things at once on my computer. But um, micro internships, I think, are exciting until they're not. And here's what I'll say about micro internships. They are a huge opportunity to diversify 
relationships and networks. When I think about some of the time I wasted in long internships where I was doing file work in the corner, I wasn't meeting anyone, um, that is actually not a great boon for, for young people. But, um, and so therefore doing a bunch of micro internships is actually really exciting from an expanding your network standpoint. The flip side of this though, is that there's a risk that this is really going to proliferate gig work um, for young people on the wrong side of opportunity gaps and young people with more access to opportunity will continue to have longer, better paying internships. And so the thing I would keep an eye on as a school operator is, are we ensuring that the payoff of those micro internships is real? Um, that there's a real ROI or return on investment for young people and that they are actually converting into longer term work opportunities. And I know that's a mouthful, but I think that's the quality assurance thing we have to keep an eye on as micro internships start to really proliferate. Which of these? Yes, Josh Schachter. Hello, Josh Schachter. Um, Josh Schachter is actually the founder of Community Share, so he can share more about his model in the chat. Um, I think that some models uh, that are specifically really focused on so social capital and equities, Talent Accelerator, which I mentioned, um, Career Village is a nonprofit that's actually starting to partner with school districts trying to address network gaps. Um, I think others of these models are actually serving schools of all demographics, right? So NEPRA, Student Success Agency, cross multiple demographics, Parker Dewey as well. Um, I also wondered about gig work. This is so prevalent right now, major contributor, yes. Question from the audience. How can we connect students to feel that they are learning? How can we connect students to feel what they are learning? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that question, so if you can clarify it, that would be really helpful. helpful. Um, Nazareth Prof is doing an engineering business development marketing plan paid on the basis of work they do. Great, these are great examples from Kristen. Any ideas on how to motivate students to participate in this program? They often don't understand the benefits. So I get this question a lot. Um, students don't understand the, the relevance of a network. We were all young once, maybe, even though I feel like I've aged 50 years in the past week. Um, so I'm going to actually unpack this question on two fronts. So one is how do we get students to appreciate the importance of a network? The second question that usually comes sort of right after that is how do we teach students how to network? So I want to make sort of a uh, maybe a bold claim that this is where the role of schools um, or after school programs, wherever you work as brokers is incredibly important. I don't think that necessarily it's students' jobs to fully appreciate why a network matters down the line. I think that's unrealistic to sort of put on students developmentally. I think we can certainly teach them about why networks matter and research that um, some of our partners at the Gates Foundation have recently done to, to understand how students understand career pathways has confirmed that students understand that networks matter. Uh, they may not use the term social capital. In fact, young people hate the term social capital, in case you're not surprised to hear that. Um, but I think if schools are not willing to do the warm handoff, um, none of this is going to work. And what I mean by that is that schools have to actually really hold the two sides of a relationship, whether it's networking a young person with a prospective employer or with a community member guest speaker. Educators and school administrators have to be willing to do the warm handoff to make that connection a successful one. I have to be willing to do some of the work to make sure that young people are prepared to be successful in those relationships. So what does that look like? On the one hand, that can mean that the school is actually almost the de facto database of relationships. So if you think back to Emblaze, the big picture learning platform that I mentioned, Part of Emblaze's functionality is not just that it manages internship experiences on behalf of schools or helps schools manage their internship experiences, I should say, but it's that as a student at a big picture learning school using Emblaze, I can log onto that app and see all of the potential opportunities that students that came before me have curated and understand um, and, and have access to those sort of connections. And so essentially, rather than thinking about 
students' individual Rolodexes, you're actually building a school Rolodex of all of the assets in the neighborhood or community or business community that students can have access to. So that's number one, really making that information transparent and accessible to students. The second that's a lot harder, and it's the hardest part of sort of any relationship driven work, is how to ensure that um, seeds of trust are being planted early when you bring young people together with people that they've never met. Um, and a lot of the work in sort of work based learning models goes into sort of teaching students workplace etiquette and how to act um, in those environments. And I think that's important, but that's actually different from trust. Um, and some of sociology research actually tells us that trust comes from a sense of similarity, right? It's a concept of homophily, just to get real wonky for a second, which is that similarity breeds trust. And sometimes if you're a young person going into a workplace, you may not feel like you have anything in common with the people that you're meeting at that internship. If you're a young person going into a video session uh, where you're going to hear about a particular career, you may not feel like you have anything in common with the person you're talking to. And so one of the things that we've actually encouraged schools to do is think about what are trust building protocols at the front end. And one way to really actually exploit that phenomenon of homophily is to do a simple exercise um, called the Me Too exercise, which was uh, branded before the Me Too movement really came about. Um, but this comes from a group called Empatico.org and they focus on how to build empathy. And Me Too is simply that I say something about myself and if the other person shares that same um, thing about themselves, they say Me Too. And if they don't, they say something about themselves and you go back and forth until you find common ground. Now, I know that sounds super cheesy, um, but it's actually a starting point to surface what otherwise might be hidden similarities between two people. And once you start to sort of sow those seeds for trust, you actually can start to overcome some of maybe the differences that could inhibit trust or actually make an interaction negative. So that's just one like very tactical recommendation. The broader point being, if we're not doing that warm handoff work, we risk actually proliferating connections that could backfire and have a negative impact on students' sense of self-worth and self-efficacy. Oh, hi, someone who works for Empatico. Hi, Todd Hall. Um, so that protocol, I don't know, Todd, if this if this aligns with your time there, that was developed in partnership with another group that I had their logo in this presentation, educurious.org, which is a online project-based um, curriculum. Oh, questions pinned at the top. An online project-based curriculum that pairs projects with um, industry experts over video chat. Great, thank you, Todd Hall. Miniature world <laughs> or echo chamber. Would love to check out your article on when I have a chance to post. Okay, great. Um, I will do that. This is like quite the format. I am feeling a lot of empathy for educators right now. Any other questions? Pin to the top. Are we talking about building these relationships as business transactions? I think it's a really good question. So um, Ashaki, I would love for to unpack more under that question if there's if you have more to say there. Um, but I think I've leaned into sort of because of the theme of the conference, I've been talking about um, professional access to professional social capital. Um, but I think that uh, when you think about all of the sorts of relationships that young people could turn to, this could be um, not just embedded in work-based learning, but embedded in sort of real world projects in your community. Josh Schachter from Community Share can speak to that. Um, and and they can be really anchored in um, what students care about of, from the perspective of their purpose. So we haven't really talked about the purpose angle on all of this because there's so many angles to relationships. But obviously, there's been a lot of work over recent decades to help students explore who they are, their identity and what they want to do in the world. Some of the models that we've been looking at recently around that work that we think are particularly networked, meaning you're going to explore your purpose, but you're going to do that through community, um, include NXU out of New York. Um, I'll put some of these in the chat. NXU, Project Wayfinder, which is a group out of Oakland. 
Um, and Road Trip Nation is another. And I think what a lot of these models are starting to do is allow for relationship building as part of a purpose and exploration exercise rather than just a work-based learning exercise. Um, so would look to those models um, for that. And I'm pulling up my <laughs> article on micro internships. Here is that article. I also want to pull up really quickly just this link to um, the webinar that Talent Accelerator is doing. If anyone is trying to sort of salvage their um, their summer programming, I think this platform has a ton to lend. So that's literally a link to like a meeting that you could go to at 4 p.m., uh, which is just it seems appropriate to the times right now. And again, that is called Talent Accelerator. If you have trouble with that, Jacob Campbell, I put up my email. I'll put it back up so you can email me and I can help you find it. Um, let me just pull my email up real quick. I feel like I'm running, but I'm just sitting. It's, it's a funny, <laughs> funny uh, phenomenon. And I'm getting a call on my cell phone just to make sure that everything is happening at once. Uh, let's see if there's other questions. Joint projects between, can you share more about Talent Accelerator? Okay, so that's, I've answered that question. If there's any other questions, please chime in. I'm so glad that we had. you know.org where we have a lot of these resources um and i think i i guess maybe i'll just as we're getting close to wrapping up i'll keep an eye on the chat for questions but i think i just want to um i want to talk about the fact that we don't accomplish things alone in our lives um and that that i think as we talk about pathways um, and particularly from an equity perspective, as we try and understand data at the individual level for young people, we can sort of inadvertently start to try and build systems that allow individuals to succeed. And whether that's climb the income distribution ladder or kind of overcome the odds. And I think that um, when we structure pipelines into careers, we have to actually structure those at the level of the community, which is, again, why I'm glad to see Josh Schachter here, so that young people have a bunch of different people to turn to at different moments. Um, and that is a very different approach than sort of thinking about an individual student's pathway in isolation. And so if I hope you take one thing away from this session, uh, it's it's that we can sort of throw relationships at the pipeline problem at different rates, at different places. Um, we can do a lot of interventions, but if we're not constantly filling a young person's reservoir of social capital, such that he or she can go back and tap into that reservoir, maybe long after he or she has graduated your school or your program, we're selling young people short. Um, we're not tapping all of the latent assets in our communities, and we're not actually ensuring that all young people have someone to turn to throughout their lives. Um, so that really is the message I'd love to end on, even though I know we're a few minutes early here. What organizations do people do you recommend who will do great work building foundational work-based skills? Students who are having their first work experience. Great question. Um, so I think there's a bunch of organizations doing great work in this space, but I'll point you to a couple. Future, fo future Focused Education, they're out of New Mexico. Big Picture Learning, they're a national network. Um, Braven is a group working with post-secondary students, but is doing a lot of thinking about how that could integrate back into being helpful to not just college students, but, sec but high school students. Um, uh, the Possible Project is another one. I'm really just riffing here on some of the models that we're hearing about doing great work. I mentioned This Way Ahead. 
Um, so those are some really powerful networks. And I think schools that can obviously is also leading in that space. Um, Connect Ed is another, the Linked Learning Alliance out in California is another. So there's a lot of groups out there that I think have thought about, again, these the skills you need to navigate work-based learning and, and particularly all those organizations I named, I think are paying attention to the relationship component of that world. So that's a brain dump from me on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> um, hopefully that's all helpful. And I know that that's um, a lot of content. Please do reach out if there's stuff you heard that piqued your interest here. Um, also, I love Amani that you were a fellow at Braven. So that comes full circle that our session coordinator uh, is thinking about that as well. So really appreciate you guys attending. Um, please reach out and I think we're going to wrap up soon here. Thank you so much, Julia. We just really appreciate you. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to our, our host for the closing ceremonies, Amani. All right. I just wanted to say thank you again to Julia for your incredibly insightful presentation and for our audience members, too, for the incredible questions you pose. Uh, we had a very fruitful discussion, and I, I know I certainly learned a lot. So thank you. Uh, we hope to all stay connected.